What's going on folks, Ted from Nerd Immersion here, and let's talk about the Dark Gifts in Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. If you're familiar with Curse of Strahd, you might know about the Amber Temple section of Curse of Strahd, and that's about the closest analogy I can give you to the Dark Gifts presented here in Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. They are a sort of monkey's paw scenario, if that rings any bells for you, but basically some sort of, it's a dark gift, it's pretty much in the name. You are given a power, an ability, or several abilities in some instances, but they all sort of come with a catch. Now, the only thing that's kind of interesting, they do provide some parameters for it, but essentially, there is no true mechanic on how you obtain a dark gift or when they're presented. So that could, I could see, potentially pose issues for new DMs, and they don't necessarily fit in any campaign, right? They, they, they might be obviously more beneficial for a horror, spooky, you know, Ravenloft-style game or Domain of Dread game, but why don't we go head over to D&D Beyond and take a look. But hey, if you like what I do here and you like the channel, consider subscribing and giving this video a thumbs up or letting me know what you think I could do better in the comments down below. All right, so Dark Gifts. This is still in the character creation chapter, and it basically kind of describes everything I just told you, but it says they are intended for starting characters, but characters who don't choose one might be presented with opportunities to gain one in the story. So it's saying right there that it, it, it sounds like when you're starting the campaign, they're suggesting you start with a dark gift, which I think, depending on the gift and what it does, is something that DMs need to consider in the power balance equation, because some of them are pretty impactful, others not so much. And then it goes on to the concept of a dark bargain, which again, pretty self-explanatory, but the scenario in which the dark gift is obtained. Um, it says, yeah, it's here, it's for people who don't have one, they might gain one. And it says at the DM's discretion, something may offer them a gift. Uh, might manifest in a dream in a moment frozen in time when the character or when the character is alone, right? So you don't necessarily have to be presented by an entity. And I like the concept of like, uh, well, I'll read it. it. Some of it reminds me of uh, some other pop culture stuff that just I can't remember exactly what it is, but says the DM might have a mysterious force intervene and offer a dark gift whenever a desperate or thematic incident presents itself. A dark lord will negotiate with a party only if a character seals the deal by accepting their dark gift. That's a great opportunity, right? Hey, I'll, you know, you know, we can negotiate, but you need to do this. And oh, I'm just giving you power, but what's the catch, you know? This one is the one that I like the most. Time stops while a character is on the brink of death. A mysterious voice offers to save the character's life, but only if they accept the dark gift. I think that one's probably the most cinematic, especially if you're the last party member standing and you're about to go down. I think that that's the one for you. An experiment or magical accident goes wrong. A character breaks a vow or suffers a curse. A character touches a mysterious amber sarcophagus and a force which entreats. They really went for mysterious amber sarcophagus. There weren't like any sarcophagus. No, it's an amber one, i.e. the Amber Temple. All right, and then it rolls into just the different dark gifts. So uh, buckle up, folks. This may be a little bit long, depending on how long it takes us to get through it. So you've been warned. All right, the Echoing Soul. Your soul isn't always your own. Uh, at least it wasn't always yours. Um, roll on the table below uh, to determine what the soul echo is. So if we say we use three, my consciousness was removed from my original body and implanted with a new one. And here's the abilities you get. Channeled prowess, proficiency in two skills of your choice. You can speak, read, and write, write one additional language of your choice. And you get intrusive echoes. Immediately after you make an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw, and roll a one on the d20, your soul's memories emerge and overtake your perceptions and experiences. You might see around you as someone other than who you are or become disoriented by a double experience of the world around you. Roll on the intrusive echoes table to determine the effects of these vivid memories and perceptions. Once one of these effects occur, the intrusive echoes can't manifest again until you take a short or long rest. So that's, so basically right at the gate, it's gonna give you two skills and a language. If you roll a natural one on anything you pretty much roll d20s for, attack roll, ability check, or saving throw, you have to roll on this table. There's no save of any kind. Something happens, you roll on this table and then you're immune to it until you take a short or long rest, and then it can happen again. So if you're a group that takes short rests often, this could impact you quite a bit. But a one is charmed by a creature you can see of the DM's choice for a minute, uh, or, until, uh, or until it damages you. Two is fr frightened, but the same thing. Three is you perceive another time or place. During this next time, you're blinded until uh, the end of your next turn. You perceive a different time or place. 
Uh, your speed is halved until the start of your end of your next turn. Rather, memories and sensations overwhelm you. You're incapacitated until the start of your next turn. Or the memory is one of triumph. You can reroll the ability check attack roll or saving throw that you just made. You must use the new roll. So one of the six potential intrusive echoes is actually a benefit for you. So that's you know a little bit of a silver lining. All right, gathered whispers. You're haunted by spiritual beings. Uh, and they kind of whisper once you perceive the spirits, unless you're able to speak with them. O only you can perceive them. Uh, here are your different spirits. We'll choose three again. Unquiet souls are drawn to me and beg for peace. Okay, so you're sort of a medium. Spirit whispers. You learn the message cantrip if you don't already know it, and it requires no components to cast it, so you don't have to give away that you're casting it. And when you cast the spell, the messages are delivered by one of your whispering spirits rather than you or the target's voice. The spellcasting ability is wisdom, uh, intelligence, or charisma. You choose. Sudden cacophony. When you're hit by an attack roll, you can use your reaction to channel your haunting spirits, letting their voices howl through you. If the attacker isn't deafened, add your proficiency bonus to your AC against that attack, potentially causing it to miss. And this is once per long rest, which makes a loud noise and scaring them. And then voices from the beyond. I don't know if they all have this mechanic, but it seems like the dark gift's downside is when you roll a natural one, the dark gift happens. So I guess a potential better option to be a halfling. Um, well, actually, it says immediately after you roll an attack roll and roll, make an attack roll and roll a one on the d20. So I wonder how that interacts with the halfling luck feature. Does like you rolled the one. Yes, you're going to re-roll it because you're a halfling. But does the fact that you initially rolled that one mean you have to roll on these tables? Or I guess maybe does the halfling ability override it because you get to re-roll it? But I don't know. Um, basically the voices are too loud, roll on this table, same thing, uh, manifests until you take a short or long rest. Uh, one, disadvantage on your next attack roll, ability check, or saving throw. You're deafened for a minute. You are frightened of the creature closest to you other than yourself until the end of your next turn. Uh, the DM chooses if there's multiple creatures or within the next 10 minutes. You can ask your spirits about the results of a specific course of action you plan to take within the next 30 minutes. You can receive an omen as if you'd cast the augury spell. It's only perceptible to you. Next up is the Living Shadow. This makes me think of the uh, Xbox 360 game, uh, The Darkness. If you guys remember that game? Um, and when it's not being watched, or I guess Peter Pan in an instance, I'm thinking more like summoning shadow creatures. This is like your shadow itself, right? When it's not being watched, my shadow makes threatening gestures or creeps towards people. All right, Grasping Shadow. You learn the Mage Hand cantrip, if you don't already know it, requiring no components. The hand... Um, Created by the spell is shadowy, but not bound to your actual shadow. Uh, shadow Strike, when you make it a melee attack roll, you can increase your reach for that attack by 10 feet. Um, your shadow stretches and does it also gives me a Shikamaru vibes. Uh, you can use this feature a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, times per long rest. And then Ominous Will is the, the later feature. So it is still, again, when you roll a 1 on the d20. It says it takes a will of its own and might hinder or assist you. The next time you are a creature within 30 feet of you that you can see makes an attack roll ability check or saving throw, roll a d4. If the number is odd, reduce the total by the number rolled. If it's even, increase the number by the increase the total by the number rolled once per short rest. It is uh it doesn't discriminate friend or foe though, so it will potentially either lessen or you know either improve or decrease either an ally or an enemy. So it kind of has a little bit of both. Um, but it also works if you do it, so it could be a detriment to you as well. That one, I think, as far as the downside goes, is probably one of the better ones, because it is still triggered on a natural one, but there's still the potential that it could be beneficial, even if it does trigger. So I think that that one might win uh, currently for the the best worst feature. All right, Mistwalker. Uh, you're able to travel through the Domains of Dread. You're part of an organization, a family, or an itinerant community with experience traveling in the mists. They taught you how to do the same. So Misty Step, you can cast Misty Step. No spell slot, once per long rest. Um, if you have spell slots of second level or higher, you can cast them with the spell. I love that they've added this wording pretty consistently now. Mist Traveler, when you enter the mists intent on reaching a specific domain, you are treated as if you possess a mist talisman, a, so a key to that domain. To use this trait, you must know the name of the domain you've chosen as your destination, but you don't need to have previously visited that land. The trait doesn't allow you to bypass domains, borders, closed by Dark Lord's will. And then Poisoned Roots. Oh, this one's different. Okay. When you finish a long rest, the world around you in a 10-mile radius becomes a siphon that will eventually leach away your vitality. 
You can remain in the area safely for a number of weeks, equal to your constitution modifier. Uh, thereafter, each time you finish a long rest in the area, you must succeed on a DC 15 con saving throw or gain a level of exhaustion that can't be removed while you remain in the area. Okay, so this one is significantly different as far as the downside goes. You get constitution modifier number of weeks to remain in the area without any negative side effects. Or you start to basically have your, you know, your will and your vitality sapped away. If you're capable of making a DC 15 constitution saving throw pretty consistently, though, this is not much of a downside for you. Uh, and it's one level of exhaustion and the DC doesn't increase. So, again, not that I'm going to say it can happen, but... If you have a paladin with a 20 charisma and you guys are level six and you have a decent constitution, it's it's possible for you to be in a spot where you might almost never be able to fail that saving throw. So then the downside really isn't one. Second skin. All right. This, I think, is like a shape changing ability. Uh, an angelic demon or an aberrant form. Roll to see what your second uh, second form looks like. All right, you can cast alter self to appear in your second form. Or, yeah, I guess shapeshifter kind. When you do so, you gain the effects of the spell's change appearance option and cannot end it to gain the benefits of a different option. Casting Alter Self in this way requires no spell slot. You must finish a short or long, or sorry, you must finish a long rest to cast it in this way again. If you have spells of second level or higher, you can cast them with this spell. When you cast Alter Self using this feature, some cosmetic aspect of your second form remains after the spell ends. This visibly marks you unless you actively hide or disguise it, or disguise it rather. The mark is perceptible change to scaly skin, stunted wings, eyes without pupils or horns, and that lasts until you finish a long rest. So that's like an alter self spell, but with like a big caveat in my mind. Um, and then there's involuntary change. Certain circumstances can activate your dark gift. After you experience this catalyst at the start of your next turn, you must succeed on a DC 15 charisma saving throw or use your action to cast alter self as described in the transformation trait below. And it will tell you what these things could be. Like, for example, the sound of ringing temple bells causes you to transform, seeing a particular phase of the moon. This one, I think, sucks entirely. I would just throw this entire one out, personally. Um, Alter Self is an okay spell. It's not worth possibly having you automatically transform whenever you hear a bell or smell a type of flower or something like that, right? Like, I, it's good, but it's also limited to the change appearance option. And yeah, you can cast it with your spell slots, but considering some of these other ones get like constant on things like skill proficiencies or access to spells that are much more useful, like Misty Step, for example, and like their negative side effects. And some of those are like, if you roll a one, then this happens and maybe it's bad. Whereas this is just like, yep, yeah, if you see it, you got to make a saving throw every time you encounter whatever your catalyst is. And then you automatically transform, potentially wasting that ability's use, uh, which I think is, again, once per long rest. And then it'll also pretend, it'll have the side effect where you look different than you did until you finish a long rest. So, yeah, throw it away. Uh, symbiotic being, obviously, my first thoughts is Venom and Carnage and the symbiotes from the Spider-Man Marvel Universe. Um but we see we have a burrowing worm-like being or an alien appendage inside an unhealing wound and so on. Let's see what this one does. Entwined existence. Your symbiote is a separate entity with its own physical form bound to yours. It isn't a separate creature that relies on you to survive. Isn't that the nature of a symbiote? It's a symbiotic relationship? Uh, all right, as its own... Uh, has wisdom, intelligence, and charisma scores. The DM sets the symbiote's abilities or determines them randomly. Roll 46 for each score, including ignoring the lowest roll and totaling the rest, so it gets its own ability scores. The symbiote can hear and see using your senses. The symbiote speaks, reads, and understands two languages, one that you speak and one is appropriate to its nature. Choose one of the following skills. Arcana, deception, history, intimidation, and insight, investigation, nature, religion, perception, or persuasion. You gain proficiency in that skill if you don't already have it, representing the symbiote's counsel and guidance. If you die, so does your symbiote. If you are subsequently returned to life, your symbiote revives as well. S sustained symbiosis. Your symbiote has a vested interest in your survival and takes steps to ensure it. When you fail a saving throw, you can choose to have your symbiote expend one of your hit dice to roll it and add the number rolled to the saving throw, potentially turning a failure into a success. If it uses this feature on a death saving throw, the, you succeed on a save and regain one hit point regardless of the number rolled on the d20. That's big because that just removs like needing. You can just get yourself up. 
uh, but it is once per long rest, sustained symbiosis. And then there is a symbiotic agenda. If we've learned anything from Venom in the black suit for Spider-Man, symbiotes can have their own agenda. Uh, it has an agenda that drives it and expects you to assist in achieving its goals. How permissive or patient it is in resolving its agenda depends on its personality that the DM determines. If you have an opportunity to advance its agenda and don't act on it, the symbiote can try to force your hand. You must succeed on a charisma saving throw, DC 12, plus the symbiote's charisma modifier, or be charmed by it for a D12 hours. While charmed, you must try to follow the symbiote's commands. If you take damage that is not self-inflicted, you can repeat the saving throw, ending the effect on a success. Roll or choose your symbiotic's agenda, or symbiotic agenda from the table below. So we can see it wants to bring a prophecy of fruition or, true fruition or thwart one. It seeks to experience new sensations. The more the bizarre, the better, and so on. All right, two left. Next up is Touch of Death. Uh, your touch is pain, harming whoever you come in contact with. Oh, God, we got a rogue scenario here. All right, you're the harbinger of a grim prophecy. Any creature you touch, uh, uh, touch damages is marked with a temporary scar of a group, fiend, deity, or other force that takes an interest in you. Um, okay, so you're basically like a grim reaper. Um, okay. Uh, death touch. You can focus your deadly touch against your foes. As an action, make one unarmed strike. On a hit, the target takes an additional d10 necrotic damage. The d10 increases at cantrip scaling levels 5th, 11th, 17th. Inescapable death. Uh, that makes me think of the grandmother from Mulan. <laughs> or not Mulan, uh, Moana. Uh, when you hit a target with an attack roll and deal necrotic damage, you ignore the target's resistance to that damage. Withering contact. When you start your turn grappling a creature or grappled by it, that creature takes a d10 necrotic damage. That's it? Everything is good? There's no downside. Am I missing something? Um, your touch is pain, harming whoever you come in contact with. The deathly power within you is beyond your control, afflicting any who touch your bare skin. By the same token, you could deliver death to your enemies with your touch. I guess the downside, it doesn't really give you a mechanical thing, though, about it. Like, this is a flavor text that, like, it hurts when people touch you. But all of the mechanics are, you're activated, right? You can focus your deadly touch against your foes. So this part doesn't trigger automatically. Like you might feel funky when someone touches you, but you don't deal this D10's worth of damage to people just by touching them because it says you have to focus it to use it against your foes. So it says as an action, make one unarmed strike. On a hit, it does a D10 necrotic, potentially all the way up to 4D10. So uh, at first I thought this was really good and it is good, don't get me wrong. But it is an, as an action, you make an one unarmed strike. So it doesn't matter if you're a monk. If you can't do four attacks with flurry of blows, an extra attack and deal, you know, an extra 40, 10 each punch. And this is an action that you're choosing to take that is dealing this, you know, as the attack, not multiple attacks, just an action. So probably better suited on a character that doesn't have extra attack. When you hit a target with an attack roll and deal necrotic damage, you ignore the target's resistance to that damage, which is nice, which also benefits if you have other attack roll based things that use that or deal necrotic damage. I'm immediately thinking of the undead warlock uh, could potentially have use of this. And then when you start your turn grappling a creature or grappled by it, it takes a d10 necrotic damage. Again, that's a specific instance where I'm grappling someone. So that's something I'd have to deal with if I'm like, trying to hold down like a town guard and be like, buddy, calm down, and I'm grappling them. If it starts its turn, I might accidentally kill it with my touch, but there's nothing that says like, if you casually touch someone, they take damage. It's just not listed there. And then lastly, we have the watchers. Something's always watching you and draws ethereal spirits that take the form of creatures made of shadow stuff, usually in the shape of tiny beasts that follow you and gather in your general vicinity. So here are our watcher lists. We're gonna go down to seven here for this one, which is stray souls, ghost orbs, shadows, ectoplasmic whips, or three is night wings, bats, moths, or owls. We have two options here. Borrowed eyes, as an action, you can influence the pres uh, presence guiding the watchers for one hour. For the duration, you gain advantage on investigation and perception checks, and you can't be blinded. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. And Dread Presence. You have disadvantage on deception checks, performance checks, and persuasion checks made against creatures that can see the watchers, and you have disadvantage on saving throws made against the scrying spell. 
You can temporarily disperse or hide the watchers with some effort with one minute of work and a successful DC 15 animal handling check. That's a charisma animal handling check. You can suppress your borrowed eyes and dread presence for one hour. Once you successfully suppress these creatures, you can't do so again until you finish a long rest. So this one also seems kind of rough. It's uh, influence them for one hour. And during that one hour, you have advantage on perception and investigation checks and you can't be blinded. That's once uh, during once a long rest. But you constantly have disadvantage on deception, performance, persuasion checks, and disadvantage on saving throws as long as they can see the watchers. So your whole positive ability is one hour per long rest. Your detrimental ability is all the time until you use and take a minute to make a saving throw to try and suppress them for one hour until you take a long rest. So yeah, folks, the dark gifts are okay. They seem kind of workshoppy, like they weren't finalized in my mind, because some of them are really fleshed out and done well. And other ones, there's just like, why? If you're gonna give the players the option to take a dark gift, why would they ever take the watchers? Or some of these other ones that are like constantly providing negatives with no real mo like quantifiable positives. Some of them, like I said, like living shadow, touch of death, those are constantly useful because you can you have things you can use all the time. Even echoing soul, two skill proficiencies is nothing to you know shake a stick at. So I don't know. Let me know what you think. Are you interested in the dark gifts? I don't really plan on using them in any of my games. I had some fun using the Amber Temple sarcophagi and different versions of that, playing with some of my players when they went to visit Barovia, but we're not playing Curse of Strahd. But I don't know. I, I kind of wanted more. Also, there's no, like, what would have been a great thing would have been mechanics or a section on designing your own dark gifts. That would be nice to teach you, like, if I want, if I don't want to use your, what do we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight total dark gifts in this book. A section telling me how best to go about designing my own seems like a no-brainer, but maybe it's later in the book and I just missed it. I don't know. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below, and I'll see you all next time.